Well, thank you very much, Anna, and, and thanks to all of you for sticking with me until the end here. Um, I have to confess that when I made up the table of contents for, this, uh, for these lectures during the summer, I had almost no concept of what I might say in the last one. But I figured if I had two months' time at MIT to come up with something, and if I only keep my antennas open and tuned, I might pick up uh, uh, some appropriate ideas. Well, sure enough, there's no shortage of stimulating ideas that relate God and computer science. I hope I'll be able to explain today some of the ones I think are most interesting and important. In fact, I thought of more than enough things to say in one lecture, and um, I had to rank order them, so I probably won't have time to talk about the one thing that I promised last week that I would say. <coughs> anyway, um, lots of people have, of course, written about God and science in general. Shortly after my arrival here, I went to a dinner hosted by a thriving local organization called the Faith and Science Exchange, celebrating its 10th anniversary. Since the early 1980s, the University of California in Berkeley has had an active center for theology uh, in the, and the natural sciences. But computer science is an unnatural science. Computer science deals with artificial things not bound by the constraints of nature. When I t chose the title of this lecture, I had a gut feeling that computer scientists can shed some new light on the subject in addition to the fine contributions already made by biologists, physicists, and other scientists as well as theologians. Because I think computer science gives us new analogies and theories that can help us to understand God. For example, when Arthur Peacock wrote 20 years ago about creation and the world of science, he compared God to the composer of a symphony writing music that obeys fixed laws but contains random elements. Peacock saw God as an improviser of unsurpassed ingenuity. Music is indeed a useful analogy because it's a flexible form that moves through time. But certainly computer programs are much richer in this respect because programs not only move through time, they also interact with people and they can also modify themselves. When I talk about computer science providing possible insights about God, of course I'm not thinking about God as a super smart intellect surrounded by large clusters of ultra-fast Linux workstations and some great search engines. That's the user's point of view. What, uh, I'm thinking about the science part of computer science, the abstract notions of processes, the theories that computer scientists have been developing about how to, how to deal with large quantities of non-uniform data in dynamic ways. Such things are much better understood now than they ever have been before, and they clearly have intimate connections with God's role as creator and sustainer of the universe. Furthermore, computational models are better able to describe many aspects of the universe better than any other models we know. All scientific theories can be modeled by programs. Years ago, I was pondering the difference between science and art. People uh, have been asking me why my books were called The Art of Computer Programming instead of The Science of Computer Programming. And I realized that there's a simple explanation. Science is what we understand well enough to explain to a computer and art is everything else. Um, so as every time science advances, uh, part of an art becomes a science, so art loses a little bit, but, but mysteriously art also seems to gain back again because as we understand more, we think of more things that, that we don't know how to explain to computers. Now, during the panel discussion a few weeks ago, it developed that a lot of people in the audience, maybe a majority, thought that um, it wouldn't be long before science catches up with art and there won't be any art left. We'll be, uh, according to that opinion, I, we'd know how to program a, a robot that would be able to do everything the people on the panel could do. Um, and also the people in the audience, I guess. Um, <clears throat> now, I personally see no signs that any such thing is on the horizon, but I do want to mention a point that Brian Hayes brought up earlier this year in American Scientist. Uh, Hayes observed that if we can create such robots, those robots would also be able to create such robots, and so on. Uh, and, and you see, this would increase the likelihood that we ourselves were created by some designer. In any case, I do think people who write programs do have a glimmer of extra insight into the nature of God for that very reason, because creating a program often means that you have to create a small universe. For example, I spent most of this year writing programs to simulate a new computer called MMIX. 
one of those programs was perhaps uh, probably the most difficult that I've ever written. Uh, and I thought hard about how it would, would be to live with such a machine and with the new tools that, uh, that I was creating, sort of like living in a new subculture. Uh, a week from today, I'm going to be talking about, uh, about that computer. Um, I think it's fair to say that many of today's large computer programs rank among the most complex intellectual achievements of all time. They're absolutely trivial by comparison with any of the works of God, but still, they're somehow closer to those works than anything else we know. My main point, um, though, is not to debate the merits of computer science, but I do want to discuss some of the things that our experiences with computers during the past 50 years have taught us. Now, first, I want to mention the fact that computing gives us great appreciation for the size of finite numbers. Now, I spoke about this many years ago at a big meeting of the American uh, Association for the Advancement of Science in Boston in uh, 1976. My paper was called Coping with Finiteness, and it was later reprinted in several books. <clears throat> I hate to repeat myself, but I suppose some of you here today were unable to hear my talk in 1976. And, and maybe you never read the paper either. And even if you did, you probably forgot about it. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes repeating some simple but eye-opening facts about finite number. Um, so I want to start small and uh, remind you that x, this, x times n uh, means x plus x plus so on uh, uh, the sum of n, n copies of the number x. Um, Similarly, uh, we can talk about x up arrow n, which is the product um, of n copies of x. For example, 10 up arrow 10 is 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 to 10, and so on. It's uh, 10 billion. Now, people usually write that as 10 to the 10th, but, uh, but I like to uh, write it with an arrow because of the next step, uh, which uses two arrows. And so if you have two arrows, uh, x double arrow n, that means you take x to the x to the x to the x to the x. Now, this arrow notation is my big claim to fame because it's what got me into the Guinness Book of World Records. Um, um, anyway, 10 double arrow 10 is, um, is that number, which you see um, is, is 1 followed by, um, by this many zeros, OK? All right, so now that's a fairly large number. Um, now, I mean, if, 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 you know, if, if you put a monkey down at a typewriter uh, and wait until he types out perfectly the entire text of Hamlet, uh, it's only one followed by about 40,000 zeros. So this is one followed by quite a few zeros. But anyway, that's, um, that's 10 double arrow 10. Now, the general rule, of course, is that if you have k arrows, uh, x k arrows n, you just uh, uh, define it as, as the k minus 1 arrow thing over and over again, all right? So I want to give you an example of a small, of a small example of the arrow functions uh, so that you can understand about these finite numbers. And I'm going to look at 10 quadruple arrow 3, OK? Now, so of course, by definition, that means 10 triple arrow, uh, 10 triple arrow 10. Um, and so we first have to evaluate 10 triple arrow 10. Well, 10 triple arrow 10, of course, is, is 10 double arrow, uh, 10 double arrow 9. Um, and uh, so um, that means this, OK? So now you see we, we just uh, expanded the 10 double arrow 10 there and replaced it by what it is. All right, so there we are. Now, uh, so now let's go one more line. You see what's coming up here? Um, uh, I can, I can uh, get rid of one more here, and, and we just have to have how, how many uh, how, how many zeros are there in that guy? Uh, wait a minute, I lost. There must be a typo here. I got to lose one more. I got to lose one more double arrow. <coughs> I just pay myself two dollars fifty six cents. I, I <laughs> um, okay. Take out one of these tens here, uh, but you see the stack of tens is is ten double arrow ten levels tall. Now that's such a I can't even tell you how big that stack of tens is without using double arrow notation. All right, so 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 anyway, that's a huge number, 
and I can't even write it down. But then we repeat the double arrow operation again, getting even huger number and so on. And, uh, and finally we get this thing evaluated and I'm calling this final result very fancy K. In fact, it, in fact, if you look at if you look at uh, at my book uh, with a magnifying glass, you'll see that you know I worked hard to make a. I mean, it was such a big number, I just couldn't use an ordinary, an ordinary letter for it. Um, now, uh, of course, we're we're not done yet. That's just ten triple arrow ten. Uh, I have to, in order to get the final number that I started with, ten quadruple arrow three. Uh, I have to take ten triple arrow. Uh, to this uh, uh, to this uh, fancy K. Now that is, of course, the double arrow operation repeated fancy K time. Now, um, if you if you stop to to think about this, I think uh, if anything is mind-boggling, uh, this I mean, just it's incredibly large. You cannot believe how how large it is. And I said here the three the three dots suppress a lot of detail. Maybe I should have used four dots. Um, um, but anyway, uh, um, if, if you don't think this number is as large as being beyond human comprehension, uh, I can at least say uh, definitely that if you consider all the numbers less than or, less than or equal to this number, most, almost all of them are impossible to, de to, to describe in any way in, in, the, in the universe. Because we know that the, that uh, most numbers description is, is, is incompressible. So anyway, that's, um, uh, of course, that's a very small as finite numbers go. Uh, almost all finite numbers are bigger than this, but, uh, but this big enough for me. Um, this big enough for me, and, and if you can really start thinking about it, you realize that, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, 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 just being finite isn't that much of a limitation. Um, and and uh, uh, now I'm going to call this number super k, this 10 quadruple arrow 3, I'm going to call it super k. Um, and uh, w when you start to comprehend the immensity of super k, y you see how pointless are the philosopher philosopher's discussions about finite versus infinite. Um, infinity is a red herring. Uh, you know, I, I would be perfectly happy to give up immortality if, if I could only live for super k years before dying. <laughs> In fact, you know, super K nanoseconds is enough. Now, okay. So, now, now, many years ago, I learned about about Cantor's famous theory about higher orders of infinity. I learned the beautifully simple fact that the set of all ways to label the elements of any given set with zeros and ones always has strictly more elements than the given set has. And I once thought if I ever had to preach a sermon in church, I would try to explain Cantor's theorem to my non-math friends so that they could understand something about the infinite. But now I realize that infinity is not necessarily even one of God's attributes. I'm quite willing to grant that God might indeed be infinite and might have the power to examine infinitely many possibilities in an instant. But even the ability to deal with numbers on the order of super K is more than enough to inspire awe. Moreover, I don't think theologians can really disagree with me on this. To say that God's abilities are not infinite but limited by quantities like super K is not a realistic limitation at all. Such a limitation cannot contradict the Bible or any other sacred text because natural language has no words to distinguish meaningfully between such unimaginably large magnitudes. For example, the word infinite itself occurs only three times in the, in the King James Bible. The first time is when one of Job's comrades says, Job, your iniquities are infinite. In the second place um, is, is God's understanding is said to be infinite. And in the third place, the power of Egypt is said to be infinite. Now only the second of these three applies this attribute to God, and the Hebrew words in that verse can be more accurately translated as too big to count. So the amount of academic hair splitting about finite versus infinite in the literature is itself too much to count. But it misses the point. The real point, I think, is made rather well in Psalm 139. <clears throat> o Lord, you have searched me and known me. You discern my thoughts from afar. Even before a word is on my tongue, lo, O Lord, you know it altogether. How vast is the sum of your thoughts? If I would count them, they are more than the sand. In other words, God knows incredibly more than we can understand. 
Now, um, I grew up with the idea that God constantly reads my mind, and I've always been comfortable with that invasion of my privacy. Uh, as a result, I haven't been especially successful in cryptographic research about keeping secrets. Um, now, of, of course, I don't understand how it's possible for God to read my mind or to, to penetrate anybody's consciousness, especially because every individual brain probably has its own code for information processing. But that doesn't make me disbelieve, disbelieve that God can do it, even if, I, even if we limit God to being a uh, finite capacity of size super K. Peter Gomes has wisely described the Bible as an effort to cram into the human imagination the unimaginable immensity of God. But he didn't mean to imply that the Bible makes technical distinctions about subtle mathematical details. Uh, another thing about finiteness is uh, I'd like to show you is based on a rather deep result of computer science which came out of an MIT thesis, uh, Larry Stockmeyer's thesis in 1974, uh, jointly joint work with Albert Meyer on this particular on this particular problem here well I, I guess I can put this whole slide up um, uh, here's the uh, I, I don't want to talk too much about it but uh, um, it's been it, uh, there's a theorem of, of, of Buki that says that um, um, certain statements about the positive numbers um, can be proved uh, or, or disproved in a finite amount of time. And uh, it's, uh, I mean, it, people technically in the audience, this is weak second order arithmetic. Now, if you take a, if you take a sentence of length 617 in, in, in weak second order arithmetic, you can express it in terms of 64 symbols, including a blank space, if it's a short statement. Um, and the statement might, uh, might have some quantifiers for, uh, for all for all x there exists something or other, but it's a, um, but it, it's some logical statement, and then um, uh, there's a, there's an algorithm that will tell whether or not the statement is true or false, and uh, and uh, you can and and you could build it into a circuit, and the, and uh, you would start out with a six-bit encoding of each of the symbols uh, of, of the 617 symbols, and then outside uh, uh, you know and or not gates in here. And out comes the answer: true or false. This this statement was true or false. And according to Buki's theorem, you can construct such a circuit with finitely many components, finite amount of time. But what Meyer and Stockmeyer proved is that every such circuit must use at least 10 to the 125th components, which is larger than the number of protons and neutrons in the entire known universe. And and you know you change 617 to 618, it gets harder again. So so. Um, uh, you see, there are there are limitations um, uh, on uh, of of complexity of certain computational problems. I think it's fair to say that God may well be bound by certain laws of computational complexity, um, even if we grant, as I do, that the Bible is God's inspired word. The Bible doesn't deal with Buki's theorem or any such fine points of detail, or was it ever intended to? Computer scientists today know many things about all kinds of levels of incredible difficulty that are inherent in the solution of different kinds of computational tasks, even when those tasks are solvable in finite time. These theoretical results could be used in academic discussions to restrict God's ability to be all-knowing and or all-powerful in certain ways if we assume that God has finite resources of a certain size. But I don't recommend that theologians undertake a deep study of computational complexity unless they really enjoy it. Um, because the fact is, God can know much more than enough and can be plenty powerful enough to do anything relevant to the universe without being strictly all-knowing or all-powerful. Finiteness is not a limitation in practice. So when I say that the question finite or infinite is a red herring, I don't mean simply that philosophers and theologians have often been arguing about an unimportant issue. Um, I also mean that physicists and other scientists fail to realize this. For example, take the literature of chaos theory. Hundreds of papers have been written about the behavior of solutions to unstable recurrences by people who assume that real numbers are real. Let me explain uh, to non-mathematicians in the audience. When a mathematician talks about real numbers, they, they mean decimal numbers that have infinite accuracy, infinitely many decimal places. Well, the fact is, real numbers are an abstraction. 
They're an immensely useful abstraction. Uh, the concept of real numbers allows us to use calculus, other tools of mathematics, to deduce all kinds of useful things. But it's a tremendous leap of faith to assume that real numbers apply perfectly to the real world. To assume that two physically realizable objects could be in different places even though their positions agree up to super k decimal places. I can understand why people unconsciously make this assumption. All the textbooks start with real numbers. It's a, it's a familiar concept, easy to work with. Uh, uh, similarly, after I learned geometry in high school, I thought I knew what parallel lines were. You, just, you take any line and a point off that line, well then the, that line and the point determine a plane, and in the plane there's exactly one line through the point that's parallel to the, li to the other line you started with. Parallel means never intersects that, that line. Now it seems obviously true. It's called Euclid's fifth postulate, Euclid's parallel postulate. Well, years later, I learned about non-Euclidean geometries which satisfy other axioms stated by Euclid, but not this parallel postulate. In some geometries, there can be two or more lines parallel to the given one. In other geometries, there aren't any at all. Now, I thought this was an amusing curiosity, but I never believed for a moment that non-Euclidean geometries had anything to do with reality. The possibility didn't even occur to me, since I knew that the universe was Euclidean. Maybe 20 years went by before I was shocked to realize that I had no grounds for that hypothesis at all. Euclid's law was convenient for the practical calculations I needed, but it wasn't good enough for astronomers who were faced with the actual properties of the real world. Some years ago, I wrote a book about so-called surreal numbers, which are much richer than real numbers because they include not only the real numbers, but also in infinitesimally small quantities, as well as numbers like infinity raised to the power of square root of infinity, and many other, you know, they're, they're closed on the, uh, the algebraically closed and closed under, you can add and subtract, multiply. Surreal numbers, in a sense, surreal numbers are actually simpler than real numbers are. For example, you can define surreal numbers with only two very simple axioms. I suspect that if physicists had been trained since childhood to work with surreal numbers, they would implicitly imagine that surreal numbers describe the actual universe we live in. It seems to me that a new branch of physics is needed, called maybe discrete physics or something like that, to study the effects of the assumption that parameters can be infinitely precise, and to consider instead that the universe probably has only a finite but extremely large number of states. I've heard of a few people who are working on this. It seems to me that such ideas deserve to get into the mainstream. Um, Plato once said, I have never known a mathematician who was able to reason. I think, I think he was referring to the fact that mathematicians tend to believe that their abstractions apply perfectly to, the world, uh, to a world that's more complex than they can imagine. On the other hand, according to James Jeans, Nature abhors accuracy and precision above all things. <clears throat> well, I can't dwell any longer on this because I also want to cover uh, uh, several other ideas today. The next topic I want to discuss is John Conway's Game of Life as an example of an artificially created universe. <clears throat> um, this, um, this is probably the simplest example of a cellular automaton that's really interesting. It's an idea that John came up with about the same time that he invented surreal numbers in the 1960s. Uh, we can imagine a grid that consists of square cells extending arbitrarily far in any direction. At every instant of time, each cell is either off or on. And in this picture here, the, the black ones are, are on and everything is, else is off. There's a simple rule for determining the state of each cell at the next instant of time based on the current state of the cell and its eight neighbors. So suppose k of the neighbors are on at a given time. In t, then at time t plus 1, the next time the cell is off if k is less than 2 or greater than 3. If you, if you don't have enough neighbors, you have too many neighbors, you, uh, you're off. Uh, but if k is exactly 3, you have exactly 3 neighbors, then the cell goes on. And if you have exactly 2 neighbors, the cell stays as it was before. Now, um, this configuration that, I'm, that I've got on the screen here is, is one that Bill Gosper made up um, uh, November 1997. Uh, it's called a totally aperiodic glider wave. Um, 
And uh, let, me sh let me show you what happens, for example, after one unit of time. Um, uh, you see that uh, things like this has no neighbors, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to go away. Um, th uh, some of these here have too many neighbors, they're going to go away too. The ones that have two neighbors are, are going to stay as they were. The ones that have three neighbors are going to go on. Um, and after one step, um, it goes, to, it, it, you get a pattern like this. And uh, there's wonderful resources on the web uh, about, about the, the Conway's Game of Life. You just uh, go to your favorite uh, search engine and say Conway Life, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, you, you, there's uh, it's, you know, terrific Java applets. You can watch this to your heart's content and see. And, it's, and uh, people have said even in the 70s that uh, more computer time was spent uh, simulating this game than maybe anything else. In, uh, uh, and uh, many, many uh, companies uh, banned uh, doing, uh, you know, uh, doing this because it was chewing up so much time. It is really fascinating to watch what happens. Uh, well, in this particular case, after 100 units, after 100 steps, uh, these things start to, to send out so-called gliders, and the gliders uh, uh, come in a really interesting pattern. The reason this is called totally aperiodic is because if you look at the states of any cell whatsoever, um, it's, it's not periodic. Uh, it, it, the, no cell by itself could could be described by a finite uh, uh, by a finite automaton. Um, well, uh, it, there's uh, uh, you know I could give several lectures concerning lessons about real life that could be learned by studying examples of artificial life like this. Uh, I have time to only mention a few of the main points. The first thing, it's abundantly clear that a programmer can create something and be totally aware of the laws that are obeyed by the program and yet be almost totally unaware of the consequences of those laws. Running the program with different starting configurations often leads to really surprising new behavior. Secondly, the game of life illustrates the power of evolutionary mechanisms. Stable configurations arise out of random soup very quickly usually, and many of those configurations have properties analogous to biological organisms. There's a glossary of hundreds of names for such things on the web. There's ants, bookends, bunnies, caterers, eaters, fish, gliders, as I showed you, light bulbs, and so on. But the thing that strikes me most about this game is the fact that it's obviously deterministic. I think it sheds light on the age-old question of free will versus a deterministic universe. At least it's helped me a bit with this issue. Somebody, I don't remember who it was, maybe Conway himself, told me in the 1970s <clears throat> that the computer simulated behavior of, of patterns in this game tend to be so lifelike that it actually gave him pangs of conscience whenever he would shut the computer off or, or set it to work on something else. He was killing off the creatures before those creatures had fulfilled their potential. But Conway's game of life is completely deterministic. All the future generations of every pattern, um, you know, just those simple rules of two and three neighbors, um, all, those, all the future generations of every pattern must exist whether we simulate them or not. They can't die. Pulling the plug before a computer counts up to a million doesn't harm the number one million. So now let's imagine that the universe is totally deterministic, the real universe, and, and finite, but of course extremely large. Conway and Gosper proved that the game of life is universal in the sense that this game can simulate anything that is computable by deterministic laws. Therefore, in principle, we could set up a gigantic on-off pattern that would perfectly describe the future of the entire universe starting at any given state if we simply followed Conway's rules. In fact, we could do this on a finite two-dimensional game board that was not much larger than the number of entities in the universe itself. Um, the simulation wouldn't run in real time. <laughs> in fact, uh, it, it would be mighty slow. But it wouldn't miss any detail. That's what a determin deterministic universe is like. Such a universe exists without needing to be simulated. In the same sense as any number exists without needing to be named. <clears throat> uh, Raymond Smullyan's short story, Planet Without Laughter, ends with a discussion of free will. Now, I actually like the early parts of that story better than the ending, but he's entitled to his opinions, and here's one of the things he said. He's, <clears throat> Smullyan. 
Humans are like children. The only way you can get them to do anything is to make them think that it is they who are doing it. Their pride is so great that without having the illusion of free will, they will never go forth and amount to anything. Um, and, and then, um, uh, I'm not sure if, if it was... Uh, I, if it was God in his story was saying this, I think so. And, and uh, so, it, uh, so he's saying that you know we don't have free will, but we but what we think we do because otherwise uh, it would be bad. So 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 apparently then the uh, uh, the illusion of free will is good enough. Uh, maybe what's is what Smalley is saying um, because it's essentially indistinguishable from actually having free will. Just like pseudo-random numbers are just as good as truly random numbers for all practical purposes. Well, if that is true, the illusion of free will could even have evolved by Darwinian principles. Einstein didn't believe in freedom of the will. He said, this awareness preserves me from taking too seriously myself and my fellow men as acting and deciding individuals and from losing my temper. Here I cannot agree. <clears throat> Such thoughts are so totally different from my own that when I first read them, I thought they were self-contradictory. If lack of free will kept Einstein from losing his temper, he didn't have any temper to lose. Uh, you, you don't decide whether or not you have free will if you don't have the power to make decisions. Uh, but after thinking about it some more, I had to admit that such a viewpoint is indeed logically consistent, even though I don't subscribe to it myself. Um, in my own view, people ought to take responsibility for the things they choose to do, and I think I can learn to control my temper about other people's choices without believing that they had no choice. Um, indeed, it seems impossible to me to be a parent and to observe one's own children without believing in free will. The, the traditional argument against free will by some theologians is that God cannot know everything without knowing what choices we're going to make. Now, this debate goes on, but I think the evidence for that argument is fairly weak because of the inadequacies of natural language to deal with such technicalities in a precise way. It seems much more likely to me that God is interested in our decisions and that he purposely held back from asserting total control. Now, why write a program if you already know the outcome? As a software designer, I greatly enjoy watching surreptitiously what other people are doing with the programs I've written. Well, sometimes I wince, too. Um, it's, it's similar to the feeling that parents have when, they, uh, when their children are developing attitude. Uh, sometimes they're, they're uh, very happy in some, about it. Sometimes they're alarmed, but uh, it's always interesting. Dorothy Sayers said that she enjoyed writing plays better than writing novels because the actors and actresses would reveal deeper meanings that she hadn't specifically planned. <clears throat> Now, to carry this discussion further, I need to talk a little bit about quantum mechanics. Several years ago, I chanced to open Paul Dirac's famous book on the subject, and I was surprised to find out that Dirac was not only an extremely good writer, but also that his book was not totally impossible to understand. The biggest surprise, however, actually a shock, was to learn that the, th the things he talks about in that book were completely different from anything I had ever read in Scientific American or in any other popular account of the subject. Apparently, when physicists talk to physicists, they talk about linear transformations of generalized Hilbert spaces over the complex numbers. And observable quantities are eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of Hermitian linear operators. But when physicists talk to the general public, they don't dare mention such esoteric things. So they speak instead about particles and spins and things, which are much less than half of the story. No wonder I could never really understand the popular articles. The extra detail that gets suppressed when quantum physics gets popularized amounts to the fact that according to quantum mechanics, the universe actually consists of much more data than could ever be observed. For example, Dirac's preface states that <clears throat> nature's fundamental laws do not govern the world as it appears in our mental picture in any direct way, but instead they control a substratum of which we cannot form a mental picture without introducing irrelevancies. Quantum theories are almost exactly 100 years old now, and they seem to be holding up rather well, even though Dirac's book first came out in 1930. 
uh, James Jeans explained the need for quantum physics in this way. <clears throat> At the end of the 19th century, it first became possible to study the behavior of single molecules, atoms, and electrons. The century had lasted just long enough for science to discover that certain phenomena, radiation and gravitation in particular, defied all attempts at a purely mechanical explanation. <clears throat> While philosophers were still debating whether a machine could be constructed to reproduce the thoughts of Newton, the emotions of Bach, or the inspiration of Michelangelo, the average man of science was rapidly becoming convinced that no machine could be constructed to reproduce the light of a candle or the fall of an apple. <clears throat> well, um, I can't give you a tutorial about quantum mechanics today, but I do want to mention it because a lot of computer scientists have been working together with physicists for the past several years to develop something called quantum computing. These concepts have not yet been proved, but steady progress is reported and it's not impossible that quantum computing could turn out to be a truly revolutionary breakthrough, perhaps allowing us to deal with exponentially many possibilities in linear time. I'll try to describe the situation as simply as I can without speaking of eigenvalues, but still I hope uh, I can convey some of the essence of these ideas. <clears throat> Every year at, at this time, uh, for the past six, seven years, I've, I've traditionally given a so-called Christmas tree lecture at Stanford uh, dealing with some, con some aspects of tree structures. Tree structures, um, tree structures rank among the most, uh, you know, the computer scientists most loved concepts. <clears throat> now, keep in mind that this is an idealization and oversimplification, but we have to start somewhere. Imagine starting at the top of this diagram, uh, which represents a branching point where some choice has to be made. <clears throat> also imagine that going to the left or going to the right will affect the entire future history of the universe. First, the effect will be very small, but eventually the effects will build up. After the first choice, say we go to the left, another decision has to be made, uh, maybe go to the right, and then another, and so on. So the number of possible destinies for the world goes from f 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32, and so on. Uh, if any of you saw the movie Run, Lola, Run, that came from Berlin this year, does it, did anybody know that movie? Yeah, yeah? okay, you, you have a clearer idea of, of what I'm saying. That movie, um, there's three parts to that movie, and uh, all three parts uh, uh, start out um, almost, almost the same. Uh, except maybe uh, uh, she's, uh, uh, she's one second uh, later in the second part and, and two seconds later to start in the, in the third, uh, something like that. And, uh, but, uh, but then uh, 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 what happens in the three parts, completely different ending and completely different in the middle as well. And uh, in one case, uh, the heroine dies. In one case, her boyfriend dies. In the other case, it's happily ever after. Um, but uh, it's, it's a fun movie, but it can give you some idea about, uh, about, the, uh, about what I'm saying here about changing the, the state of the universe with small changes. All of the paths in, in this tree uh, uh, are consistent with the laws of quantum mechanics. <clears throat> the most popular way to account for what we can see in physical experiments is to imagine flipping a coin at each branch point. Einstein made a famous comment that God doesn't play dice with the universe. And he held to that position for the last 30 years of his life. But nowadays, that's definitely a minority opinion. For example, Rustam Roy gave a major lecture in London 20 years ago called Living with the Dice Playing God. David Bartholomew's book of 1984, called God of Chance, said that God uses chance because it offers many advantages which is difficult to envisage being obtained in any other way, for example, in genetic evolution. Indeed, computer scientists have proved that a certain important computational task can be done much more efficiently with random numbers than they could possibly ever be done by any deterministic procedure. Many of today's best computational algorithms, like methods for searching the internet, are based on randomization. Some people, of course, are very suspicious of random choices. For, for example, Hugh Montefiore in 1985 said, chance and necessity may produce creativity, but they cannot produce purpose. <clears throat> I believe he was dead wrong. Um, 
I, I use random numbers all the time uh, with a very definite purpose to, to help me um, discover something. John Peacock's opinion is that God has perfect knowledge of the probabilities of events like radioactive decay, but he, has, he doesn't have knowledge about the outcome of those events, just of the probabilities. And, and, that, and he also says that God created such a universe intentionally. Stephen Hawking said earlier this year, all the evidence points to God being an inveterate gambler who throws the dice on every possible occasion. <clears throat> well, the picture isn't quite as simple as you might think, however, because quantum theory also implies that the probabilities aren't necessarily independent of each other. <clears throat> They're said to be entangled. In fact, quantum theory insists that certain observations have to agree even though they are individually random, and even though they're being made simultaneously in two completely different parts of the universe. Mind-boggling as it seems, quantum mechanics requires action at a distance, as if there was instantaneous communication much faster than the speed of light, in spite of what you may have been taught about the theory of relativity. Yet quantum mechanics doesn't contradict the theory of relativity, because these widely separated events are individually random. Professor Abner Shimoni of Boston U says that there is peaceful coexistence between those two theories because he says there's not really action at a distance but passion at a distance um, because of the way constraints on the, on the way that entangled choices uh, reveal themselves. Well, exploiting the counterintuitive properties of entanglement is the basis for hopes that, about quantum computing. Uh, because perhaps entangled choices can be coerced to run through many, many possibilities quickly and to sort out the good ones based on some kind of resonance. I can't claim to understand much at all about entangled bits, but for me the significance of the probabilistic model for quantum theory is <clears throat> that it clearly makes room for free will and it allows God to exert dynamic control over the world without violating any laws of physics. Um, in other words, we can think of God as a tree pruner, occasionally influencing the outcome of various branches while simultaneously adjusting the non-observable information behind the scenes so that all observations remain consistent with quantum mechanics. And we ourselves, even us, our spirits or souls or minds, whatever you want to call this part of our being, we might be little tree pruners also with much more limited and local powers, of course, but still able to exercise free will in this way. Who knows? <clears throat> Such a thing might even be easy if God sets us up behind the scenes with some useful hardware somewhere off in the hidden dimensions. <clears throat> James Jean said in 1930, for aught we know, or for aught that the new science can say to the contrary, the gods that play the part of fate to the atoms of our brains may be our own minds. <clears throat> Last Sunday I heard another relevant quotation, this one from Martin Luther King Jr. We, through our deeds and words, our silence and speech, are constantly writing in the book of life. Now, in closing, I want to say a few words about consciousness. Let's see if I can find it. Um, Stuart Sutherland, in the 1996 edition of the International Dictionary of Psychology, gave a great definition of consciousness. Here's what he said. Consciousness is the having of perceptions, thoughts, and feelings, awareness. <clears throat> the term is impossible to define except in terms that are unintelligible without a grasp of what consciousness means. <clears throat> consciousness is a fascinating but elusive phenomenon. It is impossible to specify what it is, what it does, or why it evolved. Nothing worth reading has ever been written about it. <laughs> uh, well, during my visit to uh, here at MIT, I did find one book about consciousness that was at least partly worth reading. It was called Mind and Matter by physicist Erwin Schrödinger. Uh, Schrödinger's main insight was to equate consciousness with learning. After you've learned something, you do it unconsciously. Yet consciousness remains the largest major question about which science has so far made little or no real progress. 
Computer scientists studying, studying artificial intelligence may well have the best chance of unraveling this mystery if it ever can be de demystified. <clears throat> the most promising approach that I've heard of is the notion that consciousness might be a kind of genetic algorithm in which a large pool of ideas is constantly competing for attention in our brains. These ideas fertilize each other and the fittest survivors continue the process in Darwinian fashion. As, you know, as I'm talking to you now, there's all kinds of uh, survival going on inside our heads. Now maybe something like that is going to work out. It seems to have some of the right properties, but, but, on the, uh, but maybe still the reins will still have to be controlled by some free spirit outside of the observable portion of quantum mechanics. <clears throat> As Peter Gomes has said, we experience close encounters of the transcendental kind that suggest relationships beyond the power of our experience to reckon but which we know in some fundamental way to be true. <clears throat> Please excuse me for giving so many quotations. As I was preparing these lectures, I ran across lots of things that were said better than I could say them myself and couldn't resist giving you the benefit of these other people's wisdom. I'd like to conclude by quoting once more, one more thing from the end of the talk that James Jeans gave about a similar topic. <clears throat> he said... Every conclusion that has been tentatively put forward in this lecture is quite frankly speculative and uncertain. We've tried to discuss whether present-day science has anything to say about certain difficult questions which, were perhaps, which are perhaps set forever beyond the reach of human understanding. We cannot claim to have discovered more than a very faint glimmer of light at the best. So our main contention can hardly be that the science of today has a pronouncement to make. Perhaps it ought rather to be that science should leave off making pronouncements. The river of knowledge has too often turned back on itself. Well, I, I, I have to add, uh, uh, yes, maybe we should stop making dogmatic pronouncements, but we don't stop trying to learn more. So thank you for listening. I'm ready for questions. <clears throat> Well, if there are no questions. Uh, that's one in the back, Guy. Yeah, I've got a comment. 22 years ago, I took a course when I was a graduate student here at MIT. And the title of the course was Digital Physics. It was about my perspective. Digital Physics by Ed Fredkin. Yes, he's, the, he's the, the main person. I was uh, one, of, one of the t three people I had in mind when I said that. OK. <laughs> Uh huh. And Craig just spoke just rapturously, I think, of electrons perhaps being represented by billions of cellular atomic cells of 3D framework. One of the students, yeah. a very distressed voice, said, Wouldn't that take an awfully long time? Would it be awfully slow? I see. Craig had said, How fast do you want it to be? And another student, I kind of said, One second per second. <laughs> okay. I see. So, so, um, uh, well, uh, you don't need. It, they don't have to be electrons or so on. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean the universe could very, could very well be made out of, out of uh, discrete, out of discrete components, very, very tiny. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and Fredkin has had uh, uh, thought a lot about about uh, about that. And all, uh, other other people I know, a man named uh, Poston, in um, uh, Warwick, uh, had some very interesting things about uh, about this that I read a while ago and so on there's um, but uh, uh, when I do uh, when I study computer algorithms I have to do this kind of thing all the time there's always the ideal thing given by the theory and then there's the, there's the, when you try to apply it to the to, to the world and so I have to I have to say that something is, is you know x is equal to y plus big O of z and the big O is what's is what's missing. It, uh, I always uh, uh, felt that physicists, w uh, w w w you know, we always make statements. Something is asymptotically this, but they don't say what. What they don't give the big O. They don't say how big the error is. And uh, this is this. Um, uh, I, I think would be extremely valuable to uh, to develop all of the theories of physics 
with with the big O in there, uh, where where the big O reco uh, represents uh, errors in your in in your data and in your answer. The, some arguments in mathematics I, uh, I I have not been able to get rid of big O's. Um, I mean uh, th things like the Borel Cantelli lemma and things like that I don't want to go into, but but uh, there are some processes, uh, subadditive functions that they just are existence theorems. They don't give you any way to compute bounds on what you've done. Um, but uh, uh, but I believe that the, the main theorems, the things that apply to reality, uh, 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 almost always allow you to to, to understand this. Uh, uh, the, the, the tremendous difference between um, assuming that something is infinitely accurate or 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 finite but extremely large, like super k, accurate. I just yeah. wanted to suggest another answer to the student's question, which is yes, it's slow and slow down to super k, but that's small as finite numbers go. <laughs> that's very yeah. But also the student, you, well, the student, uh, I, I I I would say um, the student is operating at the same speed um, as the as the universe. Yeah, yeah, hello. Um, no, I, uh, okay. Uh, the question is, if if the world uh, is deterministic, does that disprove the existence of God? No, no. That it, it it just disproves the existence of free will. Um, it's it's uh, that, that's, those are different questions. But I but uh, I, I but in fact, uh, this idea that if we that that recording all the state of everything in the world, um, uh, that seems to be. Uh, completely beyond uh, the possibilities uh, of, of uh, present present-day physics, because present-day physics uh, uses complex numbers and all kinds of unobservable things that that can only be observable uh, uh, if you destroy the information that's that's hidden. You, um, I don't understand how the physicists. The, the, the physicists have this have this nice theory about the way things work when they're when they're undisturbed, and then they have this theory about what happens when you make a measurement. But uh, I haven't seen what uh, what happens when a physicist gets in and I mean w when you have an equation in there for the physicist taking the measurement. Um, uh, th th there should be a way to. Uh, uh, to make the picture close on itself the way computer languages do, but uh, that doesn't. But but I, I don't see how. Uh, you know, I don't know enough about physics to see see that. But it wasn't addressed in any of the books I looked at. <clears throat> A question over here. <clears throat> What does the, this this this, um, the, the, these issues of computational complexity have to do with good, bad, and, and purpose? Um, yeah, yeah, well, that's a terrific question. Um, I didn't address anything about purpose in here except that I said, I, you know, I, I I use randomness for my own purposes, and I sort of assumed, uh, uh, mistakenly probably, that I that God would have certain purposes, and as if uh, he, he were um, uh, a human being. Um, uh, so I, I know that it's um, that it's uh, uh, you know, not valid to try to uh, to to second guess God uh, with with human uh, concepts. Um, but that's the only way I have of of trying to understand things and. Uh, there's big questions about why, you know, why are firemen, uh, uh, why do firemen die, and so on. Um, it, you know, it, it, if um, 
did, did God, uh, uh, you know, shouldn't God have, have done something so that didn't happen and so on? Uh, well, we have no idea what would happen if, if, uh, you know, if, if the other branches of, of the tree were taken. Um, uh, but I, I'm afraid I haven't got any, any good answers to, to this that, that, that uh, add, add to what the people have said over the years about it. I mean, uh, Leibniz said uh, that <clears throat> we live in the best of all possible worlds in the sense that of, of, of possible. In other words, he, uh, Leibniz says God, God has looked through and saw, seen all, all worlds that are possible. There aren't very many are possible, but, but of the ones that are possible, um, he chose the best. And, um, uh, you know, it, and it's not our idea of best, uh, but we don't know what's possible and what's impossible. That was his answer. But there's been other people thinking about these things over the years. I don't know if computer science has anything uh, to add. Um, a question from this side? Yes. What makes you think that the Bible is the word of God, or is that an axiom chosen at random? That's an axiom uh, that that I that I tend to uh, find find confirmed uh, uh, as I as I, as I look at it. Uh, but I don't treat the Bibles literally as an ax as axioms, though. I mean, I don't say that the book of Revelation is a set of axioms or things like that. But I think that the Bible re reflects uh, God's, God's messages um, if we understand the, uh, the way it w in which it was, it was um, uh, written and, and the, the process of uh, the, the historical process, the difficulties of, of going through thousands of years. Uh, um, I think a lot of, uh, 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 you know, I th think there's, that's one of the best clues uh, uh, other than the universe itself uh, as to uh, what God wants us to do. That's what I was talking about last week. Um, uh, but um, uh, it's nothing that I would expect that I could persuade anyone else of uh, by, a, by a mathematical argument. It's all, and, and there, there are other there are other religions that I respect very well uh, that uh, uh, that I believe God is, is speaking in in, the, in their in their uh, scriptures as well. Question here. Yes. Is that the case? Do you see God as standing outside of that universe or as coexistence is part Yeah, do I see God as standing outside a universe uh, and letting you know letting it run? And the answer is no. I see him as a tree. I, I see him as as active all the way through. In fact, uh, I I don't. The way I view God myself, it uh, you might. Uh, uh, it's, it, it has lots in common with pantheism, <laughs> where, where there, you know God's everywhere. Um, it, um, uh, those co those concepts, uh, some people think they're diametrically opposed, and and actually, it, it, in essence, uh, 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 you know, uh, from a computer programming standpoint, I you know I can I can conceive of of uh, distributed computing, um, but uh, you know lots of cooperating. Things that are all really one pro one program. The way I think of an ant colony as a single it organism. <clears throat> interleaved with. Yeah, right. I mean, you know. Um, it, um, no, it, it's a, uh, it's uh, it's in another dimension. I mean, do you understand uh, how how uh, if 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 it, you know. It, if we if we live in a two-dimensional universe, there would be things that we wouldn't that we wouldn't uh, uh, perceive. Then it'll, never be it'll never be describable, describable by physicists. Yeah, that's true. But I don't think that that's bad. I, I mean, I think that uh, you know, uh, do you have to know? I mean, if, if you knew, that would be kind of boring after a week. <laughs> yes.
Um, well, there's this. So, so what? What I? Yeah. Well, this is this is an interesting this is an interesting uh, point as to. Um, uh, I mean, uh, the, the classical thing is if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to, you know, the forest is in a black hole, uh, did, did the tree really fall? Um, uh, and um, so um, uh, if, uh, if nobody has ever named the numbers up to super K, do they exist? You know, I mean, they, we, we um, and, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm willing, you know, Quite willing to believe that the number five exists and six and seven and so on and all the numbers I can count up to, but but does that mean that I that all finite numbers uh, just you know have, have an independent existence? That's what I meant by 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 being, being deterministic, that it's that it's it's there. So uh, uh, so, so uh, uh, you know I mean it's just like uh, if all the jokes in the world were numbered and somebody was come to somebody and say 37. And <laughs> Uh, uh, and so, so, so our universe would, would would be number such and such, you know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was also, you know, there's also a, a, a I didn't want, want to go into. There's also this many worlds hypothesis. I I tended to to think that it's it's too wild uh, to really be uh, uh, to, to really even even correspond to quantum physics. But some people have, have used it to. Um, uh, account for entanglement, wh where they say that all of these branches actually are true. Uh, in other words, as we're talking, uh, the the, uni uh, the, um, the universe is going on, and, and all these branches, uh, like you and I, are are, are existing. Um, and uh, you know, all three of the things that happened to Lola happened. Um, and uh, you know, she, uh, in, in some of them, uh, uh, the ending is better than others. <laughs> and um, uh, and, and we just, you know, um, these are all solutions to equations. Um, and uh, this is the way, uh, you know, this is the way a computer scientist looks at non-deterministic computation, as if all of them are going on at, uh, uh, and, and clones of each other. Um, <clears throat> now, um, we have no way to to uh, uh, to test this hypothesis. <laughs> um, it, um, and uh, so maybe you know, uh, in, 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 you know, in some of those we um, we, uh, we just die earlier, whatever you know. Um, and and then uh, you get the question: What is consciousness? Uh, uh, because the consciousness has to be some kind of a. Um, I mean, each each of our individual consciousness has to be attached to every branch of this tree. But but these, you know, anyway, there's lots of speculations of this of this abstract kind that. Um, I think we can never really know uh, what they what, what they mean. I, I I probably didn't answer your question, but those are some of the com complexities that are associated with it. David, um, this is sort of a follow-up to the last two questions. Rather than state in general form, I'm going to ask it as a specific example. Um, is are you part of God? Am I part of God? Um, that's a good. That's an interesting thing. Uh, uh, I, 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 what? No, no, no. I, I, I uh, uh, you know, I, this. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the conclusion are, but but uh, there's, but the, yeah, you know, it's it's Christian dogma that that God is in us and we're in God. Um, that that um, and that is why, uh, for example, uh, uh, like like this this passage that said, uh, "Refrain from sexual immorality because uh, uh, you're part of God." Uh, you know, that's that's part of the you know that's that's part of a motivational thing, um, but. Um, uh, I, I I don't feel that I'm a an antagonist of God or something like that, but I still think I have a free will that makes that that's independent in, in some sense of God. Is there any sense in which it could be true that each of us is all of God? Is there a sense in which each of us could be all of God? Do you mean each of us individually? Yes. Um, <coughs> 
well, I suppose there is exists a sense, but I would I don't I don't know. I certainly don't feel like God. <laughs> uh, yes. I can't hear. The last three or four questions touching on this one. Is do you find something in your mathematical understanding of things that gives a demarcation between running experiments, as the questioner asked back there, and a Udokan experiment, which really think through what might happen? And Einstein is Okay, a distinction between running an experiment and thinking about the experiment. Um, well, in my thought process, are you assuming that my thought processes are accurate? I, um, um, I, you know, mine aren't, but maybe, uh, but maybe a perfect, uh, a perfect uh, a computer, a perfect creator would, would be able to go through uh, and w and wouldn't. Um, uh, wouldn't have to run it, uh, run something. Um, so my my view of this thing is that it is that the, that God is dynamically involved and and act, and actively interested in the choices that we make. But as I say, there's no way to prove any of these things. But I but I, so I I see it though like like as if I'm. As if, uh, uh, you know, weak analogy, but still, as good as we have, uh, uh, like a user of software or something. Where, like, like when I, um, Joe Moses had this Maxima system at MIT uh, 20 years ago, and I used to log in from California to use it. And there were always people watching me as I was using it. And I was glad to know that. Because you know, every once in a while, they might type out in my terminal. Did you mean to do this? You know, and and uh, th now that's the kind of attitude that I'm thinking God is using with me uh, in life. Uh, I don't know Schrodinger's cat about. I'm sorry. I I've heard a couple of times, and there's something about cat dying, and I hate to think about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I I I, uh, I don't have time to, to go into that right now because because it I, I've tried before. Yeah. Hello. What are your thoughts on prayer? Um, yeah. My, my thoughts on yeah. My thoughts on prayer are uh, complicated. I hope I get them get them right. I I I um, I mean I, th I hope I can explain them. Uh, I don't believe in prayer for selfish things. Um, where where I say you know I want to pray in order to get an advantage you know uh, uh, something uh, I think of prayer as as conversation with God um, that I I would you know even if I didn't know that prayer was effective I would do it anyway um, it's just something that that feels natural um, I when I was when I was a child I I thought about you know prayer in a very in very selfish way. I mean, I remember rather quite vividly, uh, um, you know, he hearing that if you uh, if you ask God for something, he'll he'll, he'll grant your wish. And, and I wanted a Ferris wheel. Um, <laughs> this is it, you know, and I and I went to sleep and I and I said my prayers and I said, um, uh, please, please God, bring a fer put a Ferris wheel on the front on the front lawn tomorrow morning. Uh, this is I'm serious. And the next morning, I ran to the window. Uh, expecting to see it there, and it was very shocking to me that it wasn't there. Um, now that's complete. That I say is a completely wrong attitude to prayer. But it's but it was something that I you know that. I, uh, but now no, it's it's a it's a conversation. Uh, you know I I I, I hope that uh, that uh, that God will do something. But I don't do it uh, in order to get a get an extra a thing about it. It's just something that that I, I feel like doing the way I feel like hugging my wife sometimes. And, I don't know. <laughs>